Perfect Twins. I believe you're the one who actually discovered it. Um, what does it say? What? And I know there was like a lot of hype in it regarding sirtuins and longevity for humans. Yeah. Um, can you talk about what it says in yeast worms and also human studies? Sure. So this is, again, it's kind of like caloric restriction. There's there's a lot to unpack when it comes to sirtuins, but I'll try to I'll try to do the like two minute version here. Um, so. <laughs> So you're right. So it was, it, it was my graduate work along with uh, Mitch McVeigh, who was a grad student in the Granty lab at the same time that first showed in yeast that if you overexpressed this gene called SIR2, that we could extend lifespan. And, and we had, you know, we had a reason to go looking at SIR2 at the time and that I won't get into, but that was before, that was before anybody was studying SIR2 or before the word SIR2 actually, you know, existed. So, so the word SIR2 comes from SIR2. So SIR2 Two N is a family of enzymes that are all related to the yeast SIR2 gene that we overexpressed in extended lifespan, um, and they are sort of unique in the sense that they have they have a specific enzymatic activity. They're they're what are called NAD dependent deacetylases, um, and so what that means is they use NAD, which is a cofactor, a metabolic cofactor, to deacetylate proteins, and in yeast they deacetylate histones, which is ties into epigenetics, right? So they're an epigenetic regulator. Um, and that's their mechanism of extending lifespan in yeast. So, you know, when we published this, not too many people paid a lot of attention to it because it was in yeast. I think when people really started to get interested was when Heidi Tissenbaum, who was a postdoc in the Grantee lab at the time, showed that if you overexpress the worm version of SIR2, which is called SIR2.1, you could extend lifespan in worms. And I think that caught people's attention because then all of a sudden it wasn't a yeast specific thing, it was more general. Um, and then Steve Helfand's lab published that if you did that in flies, you could extend lifespan in flies. And then for many, many years, I mean, this was back, you know, the early 2000s when the, the worm and the fly work were done, you know, for many, many years, people tried and tried and tried and tried and tried to show that you could do the same thing in mice and it just didn't work um, or it worked, you know, barely. There's one paper now showing that if you overexpress the mouse version of SIR2, which is called SIR-T1, the in brain, in a very specific region of brain, you can get a small effect on lifespan. So I don't really know how to interpret that because, you know, if you try to do the same experiment enough times, eventually you might get a small effect. Is it real? Is it important? I don't know. So my view on sir t one is it, it does a lot. So the biology is important. How effective it is as an aging target, a little bit unclear. The thing about sir is at least in mammals, there are seven of them. So there's sir t one through sir t seven in mice and people. So that gives you a lot more shots on goal to go out there and try to find something, you know, important for aging. And, and the, the one that looks like the best case can be made right now is, is a, a SIR2 one called SIR T6, where if you overexpress that in mice, you can get lifespan extension um, that looks pretty real. I don't, I don't remember the percent effect, but I think it's around 20%. So it's not tiny by mouse lifespan experiments. The interesting thing about SIR T6 is it, of all the SIR2 ones, it's the one that's probably got the function closest to yeast SIR2 in the sense that it's a histone deacetylase. So, you know, maybe, maybe there's, maybe there's something really useful there. My sort of view on SIR2 ones is, if you just look at the literature as a whole, um, they're in the same network that affects aging as mTOR and insulin signaling and AMP kinase. So these things are all interacting. Um, I'm still not completely convinced that sirtuins are gonna be a, a particularly useful target from an interventional perspective. A lot of other people think they are and a lot of other people are, are studying this. So so I'm not saying they're not going to be, but, but I haven't really seen anything that makes me think that they're particularly important or particularly good targets from a, a, a therapeutic perspective for affecting the biology of aging. But they're, you know, they're in the neighborhood. They're, 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 they're in there with, with the rest of the network. I see. And, and one thing you mentioned was that sirtuins are NAD dependent. Is there any data showing that if you boost levels of NAD through precursors, it boosts... Um, either independently affects longevity or by boosting the activity of sirtuins has any effect whatsoever. Yeah, there's absolutely data out there and you'll find, you know, many people, I don't know about many, there are, there are people in the field who will argue that's exactly what NAD precursors are doing is activating sirtuins and increasing lifespan. You'll find other people who will say that that's nonsense, right? Um, so I, I guess what I would say is there's no data that has been reproducible and convinces me mm -hmm that NAD precursors are 
slowing aging by activating sirtuins in a mammal, right? Um, so the, the one study in mice that showed a significant lifespan extension um, uh, from nicotinamid riboside, which is one of the NAD precursors, that was a study where older mice were treated with nicotinamid riboside, I think from 18, 18 or 20 months of age. And there was a, a lifespan extension. I don't remember the exact percent, but it was in the 15 to 20% range, I think. So that, that was a really nice study in some ways because they showed not only lifespan extension, but other metabolic effects consistent with effects on aging. But if you actually look at the data for the lifespan experiment, their control strain was really, really short-lived. And the nicotinamid riboside treated strain was not really much longer than where the control strain should have been in a study where you had a normal lived control strain. So it's not a super compelling piece of data in, from that experiment that, that the, the treatment actually had a big effect on lifespan. And then when you combine that with the fact that the interventions testing program tried to, to test nicotinamid riboside for lifespan extension in a different strain background, they saw no effect. Mm -hmm. So you know, my feeling is that there's not really much reason to believe that nicotinamide riboside has big effects on, on aging in mice. And, you know, the whole rationale for people taking these NAD precursors is based on the mouse data, right? So not a lot of rationale in my view yet that, that these things can boost um, health and longevity in people. But, you know, as I said, there are other people in the field who are very smart scientists who, you know, really think that there's a lot of good reason to believe that these NAD precursors can have effects on health and, and longevity. And so, you know, that's my opinion. I'm just, I'm, sometimes it takes a bit more to convince me than it takes to convince other people. Fair. Yeah. Now I'm curious for the data to come out and the actual studies done.